So I have to put the step down after Doug is here, so I'm tall enough, and I have to follow a poem. <laughs> But both Karen Slaughter and Elizabeth, I can say that too, Elizabeth Buzelli are well acquainted with crime and murder. Karen Slaughter is the international number one best-selling author of several crime novels, and Traverse City resident Elizabeth Buzelli is the author of several mystery novels herself. Buzelli teaches creative writing at Northwestern Michigan College and at writers' conferences around the country. Before publishing her first book, Blind Slighted, in 2001, Karen Slaughter owned and operated a sign business. But Blind Slighted became an international success, and since then, she has sold more than 30 million copies of her books and is published in 32 languages. As Doug mentioned, Karen's book just went on sale earlier this week, and Traverse City is only the third stop on her tour. Um, and we're very glad to have her here tonight, because when we went to pick her up in the airport, a little bit of a mystery happened. She wasn't there. And we called the publicist and they said, did you have her paged? And I said, have you ever been to the Traverse City Airport? <laughs> we just yelled, Karen! <laughs> the funny thing is then the publicist called us back and said she's checked into her hotel. And we said, how did she get there? And they said there was a car waiting out front with somebody holding a sign with her name on it. <laughs> and she got in the car. <laughs> Fortunately, it was all just kind of a, a, a mix-up. The publisher had sent this car for her and then canceled it, and it just all got mixed up. But Karen was really breathed a sigh of relief that she made it here safely after she found out that um, no one really knew how that car got there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm currently reading her book, Unseen, and it is so good and such a page-turner that I'm a little bit sad, just a little bit, that I actually have to be here tonight instead of um, curled up in a chair finishing that book. But I'll finish it into the wee hours this evening. Tonight, I'm just going to enjoy listening to two incredible people on this stage, Karen Slaughter and Elizabeth Buzelli. Please join me in welcoming them here. Watch out. I know. <laughs> Welcome, Karen Slaughter, to Traverse City. Thank Did you, you get to see anything of our town? Um, yeah, I got to walk around and look at the shops, and uh, it was really fun. I, and I'm, I think I dodged a bullet because the cherry festival was coming up, and trust me, I wouldn't have been able to see anything but <laughs> no. tourists. Yeah, yeah. And if you do get a chance to go shopping and you're in the market for anything with cherries on it, this is the this place. Is the place. Oh, okay. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the cherry capital of the universe. I'm really happy to have you here tonight at the Opera House. You have 14 novels out, or how many now? I might have, in the last month, maybe. I, I think it is 14. Oh. Yeah. And how many millions would you say have been sold? Um, I, you know, I don't know. The last I heard was 30. Um, mm -hmm. I hope it's not all the same person. <laughs> uh, the crime writers tend to have some crazy fans. So. Yeah, but that's a crazy fan with a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. Look yeah. them up. Um, you can almost hear the envy um, going through the auditorium. I know I have some of my students here, too. And uh, to reach this pitch, this level of success, it, it's, it's got to have changed you in somehow, hasn't it? Um, well, uh, I'm sure it has, but also I was published before I turned 30. Yeah. And just uh, not being uh, before I was 30 anymore changed me a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and the characters grew along with me, uh, Sarah Linton especially, because she's oh. the character I've written about in all but two books, mm -hmm. uh, or three now with this. And, um, you know, as I got older, she was much looser about some things. She didn't work out as much. If she wanted cake, she ate cake. Oh. Um, and uh, she didn't put up with a lot of crap. Uh, so I think that that changed the most. Uh, if you want to f see how I changed, probably look at what Sarah's doing. So you think Sarah's kind of followed? So if we follow Sarah, we know what's happening to you then? Well, pretty, except for all the loss and the murder and the oh. tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to talk about Cop Down a little bit here at the beginning. Um, it is a standalone, which means it's not part of your two big series. And it is hot off the presses right now, and we're very fortunate to have you here. And the reviews are great. And if I can give a review, I've read it twice. I absolutely love this book. Thank you. Um, 
I love it because of the depth that you go to and places you take these characters. And I love the characters. They're flawed. Wow. Tell us a, a little bit about Capcom. Well, I mean, just in an overall kind of this is a thriller sort of story, it's about a cop killer, uh, a serial killer. And this was pretty common in the 1970s for people to kill police officers. In Atlanta alone, we had, during that decade, 12 officers murdered. Uh, and this was something that happened all over the country. And if you think about the 60s being uh, the screw authority decade, uh, people were actually starting to do something about it in the 70s yeah. uh, in very violent ways. Um, the people who were still caught up in that and the ones who didn't get a mortgage and have a family and uh, give up on being uh, radicals. Um, so this was a very tumultuous and dangerous time. Um, as far as the, the structure of the book, you know, it's set in Atlanta in 1974. This is when the city went from being majority white to majority black. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one of the first African-American mayors of any large American city. Uh, the other one was in Detroit, and he was um, indicted um, <laughs> a year later. And we've had our, our share of indicted mayors, but uh, this mayor in particular, Maynard Jackson, was a fantastic mayor uh, th because he really did not care about color except green. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something Atlantans really can get behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he brought in a lot of industry. He expanded the airport under his leadership. It became uh -huh. the busiest airport in the world. I mean, it really, he, he was very vocal getting the Olympics to Atlanta, which mm -hmm. completely changed the, the makeup of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the greatest stories I heard about him was from his widow. And she was talking about the first time he went into the Commerce Club as mayor. And I'm sure there's a, a, a similar club here in Traverse City in every town where business is done. Mm -hmm. And so he went to this restaurant and he had his staff with him and they said, I'm sorry, sir, but you can't bring the woman in your staff. And he said, well, then we won't do business here. Oh. And he turned around and he walked away. Now, many politicians today would say that they would do that, but they actually wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually did. And he turned around and walked away, and th they had to force either go bankrupt or they had to let yeah. women in. So he taught them a new way that he was bringing to the exactly. city. Exactly. Yeah. That's not what came to Detroit, trust me. No, no. <laughs> well, we also had something that's probably one of the most viable industries in the entire world. Uh, for his addictive qualities, unlike automobiles, and that's Coca-Cola. And that, oh, had, yeah. that made a huge difference. And even, you know, in the 1970s, one of my characters in Coptown lives in an area called Buckhead. She grew up there. And this is our really Tony rich people area. We had, uh, in the 70s, it was all old money. Now a lot of rap stars have moved in, and um, people are clutching their pearls over that. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, Asa Candler was in charge of the Coca-Cola company, and he really believed in not just philanthropy, but using money to achieve social change. Oh. Um, he started the CDC because he noticed that his caddies were all getting malaria from the mos mosquitoes. Oh, my goodness. And uh, so it was a, a mosquito project, basically for golfers. I'm sure there are men in here who can appreciate that. And um, th that eventually became the CDC. He sold the, that land to the government for a dollar and let them have all the, the research and, you know. Uh, and another thing he did, when I was talking to people from this era, uh, there's this great woman um, who's 92 years old and she grew up in Buckhead and um, was part of that community. And she said, I remember when Martin Luther King Jr. won the Nobel Peace Prize and everyone was outraged that there wasn't some sort of dinner in Atlanta to celebrate this. And even though everyone was outraged, no one was strong enough to speak up and say, uh -huh. we have to do something. Oh. And so Asa Candler called up people and said, I think we should have a dinner. And they had it a week later. Oh, good. So, oh, you know, I think that one thing I learned with Cop Town is that power is never taken. It's mm -hmm. always given. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is about women who are police officers on the police force when no one wants them there. Um, the men don't want them there. Uh, the only thing the black cops and the white cops can agree on is that policing is not a place for women. Mm -hmm. Their families didn't want them there. They were terrified that something awful would happen or that they would be sullied and never marry a good man. Um, and, you know, it was an incredibly dangerous job, uh, not just physically, but mentally, socially. You know, they were put into these extreme environments. And I had, as I talked to different people, like this 
92-year-old woman and a bunch of retired female police officers. It just gave me such respect for what they had to do and oh, what they had yeah. to go through. Yeah. My grandmother was, well, my father was born in Atlanta, and so my grandmother lived there. And talk about Coke. That was at a time when I guess there was real cocaine in Coke, and she <laughs> used to send him down to the store every morning to come back with a bucket of Coke. So maybe... <laughs> <laughs> That's a different side of Coke. <laughs> I've read your books. I've read just about all of them now. I tried not to get them all mixed up in my head because they're all in there kind of running around. And, and it, it just struck me that what you write and with the success you're having, the millions of books that you sell all around the world, this is like the new people's literature. People want to read these books. And it took me back to Charles Dickens in his time, 1900s, uh, 19th century, and how he was born in the lower echelons of London, and he wrote about murder and prostitutes, and they came out in little penny dreadfuls and so forth. But whose books are still selling today? And it's just as though this is what the people want to read. And thank God, people are really reading again. They are. And, and they're very bloodthirsty, which is good for our business. <laughs> but you know, Dickens, the one thing Dickens did, because a lot of authors, especially what they call literary authors who are out promoting my navel myself or some other engaging tome, they, they disdain this sort of thing. And Dickens did performances. He did yeah. all, he, he would come, if he were alive today, he would be on your wall as someone who's come here and talked about his books. Yeah. Um, but back to your comments about people reading this, you know, it's very difficult to name a book that really endures, that doesn't have some sort of crime in it. Oh, yeah. Um, even Gone with the Wind has a murder in it. Um, Scarlet kills the Yankee in cold blood. Yeah. And if you read the passage, she talks about how she has this bloodlust and she wants to dance in this still warm blood and it's very descriptive. Oh. Um, and if you're, hopefully you're familiar with the book, there might be some young people who aren't, read the book. Um, and so, you know, that when she shoots the Yankee, you see Melanie Wilkes at the top of the stairs and this is in the movie too. And before this, Melanie Wilkes is this milquetoast, Scarlet can't stand. She thinks she's a weak woman. And then Melanie sees that Scarlett has killed someone, and instead of falling apart, she says, we need to bury the body. And not just that, she says, can we check his pockets for money? Uh, and that changes their relationship. And when I write crime stories, I think about that scene and how important it is in the book about these women's relationships, because they really become stronger because of it. And to me, that's the whole point of writing about crime. I never want a book uh, with my name on it, where you can take the crime out and the book still reads like a regular book. Mm -hmm. You really need to make sure that it's integrated into the story and that it belongs there. And you're not writing to titillate, you're writing to inform, you're writing to move the plot forward. And I feel the same way about sex scenes, you know? If it doesn't say something about the character, who they are at the point, if it doesn't move the plot forward, then you shouldn't have it there, yeah. unless you're E.L. James. Yeah. <laughs> You have two main series. The first one is the Grant County series, and that takes place in a small Georgia town. Mm -hmm. Was that your, the town where you were born? Well, it was an amalgamation of the towns I knew growing up. Um, there were three cities, and you know, there was the bad city, and the good middle class city, and the rich city. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it would be really nice to write about that. They always say, write what you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you also need to write what you want to know. Yeah. And I want to know why crime <clears throat> changes communities. I grew up in a time of the Atlanta child murders. Yeah, I was yeah. about eight or nine years old. And, you know, for a kid to know that children can be harmed like that was a startling thing in the 1970s. Um, you just didn't hear about that kind of awful stuff. And it changed my life um, in a really uh, selfish sort of kid way. Mm -hmm. I was really upset because I couldn't go down certain streets in my bike. And, um, you know, in the summer, my parents used to lock the door and you know, if they told us if we got thirsty, there was a hose um, and not to come back inside until we'd played ourselves out. Yeah. And they didn't do that anymore. They wanted us to stay inside. Um, it really changed my life. And so when I was writing Grant County, I thought I wanna write about that, not just crime, but how <laughs> it changes people, how it changes the detectives and the uh, doctors and the people who work on the cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I, it's a close-ended series. There are six books in the series. Um, 
and it was really uh, a great experiment for me um, because, you know, after a certain point, you think, why is anybody living here? They're murderers and rapists <laughs> and, you know, God, move to Atlanta. You'll be safe there. Um, but uh, it was really great to find my voice in that series. How, and then you went on to the series in Atlanta, the Will Trent series. Mm -hmm. Did you feel you had to get out of that small town in order to kind of enlarge your landscape? Absolutely, and you know, the, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is to Georgia what the FBI is to the country. So they can go in any jurisdiction as long as they're asked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, well, let me have Will Trent be a GBI agent so I can kill people all over the state, and it's much more <laughs> believable. <laughs> Where did your first novel, Blindsided, come from? Well, I had my sign company at the time, and I um, sold it when I got an agent mm -hmm. because I thought, this is my chance. I don't want to be a sign maker. I want to be a writer. That was my dream. Yeah. And I thought, you know, you can't, I don't want to be looking back and saying, why didn't you try this? Why yeah. didn't you put everything into it? So I sold my business, and wow. in return for taking a very extreme pay cut, I worked four days a week. And I would get up in the morning and write and go home at night and write. And then on the weekends, I would write. And I was working on a book that was basically Gone with the Wind, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I didn't realize you probably shouldn't do if you're a writer. <laughs> um, and uh, it, I, it got rejected everywhere. But people said, you know, we like the, the voice. It's just this book doesn't work for us. We want to see something else. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation with my agent, and she said, well, what do you want to do next? And I said, I love crime fiction. I've always wanted to do that. And she said, try it. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, then try something else. And I wrote Blindsided. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. And I'm gonna I wanted to find out if you'd ever had a lot of rejections, which I was hoping for, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> I've had tons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, your novels are tough, they're real, they're bloody, they're gutsy, they're all those things is sex of all persuasions. Do you ever get tired of people asking you, oh, a woman, what do you write this for when they don't ask that of male writers who write the same things? It's true. And you know, it, I know you've had Mike Connolly and Lee Child here, and I just read uh, Personal, Lee Child's next book that's out, I think in September, it's fantastic. I love Jack Reacher. Um, but he kills a lot of people, and he breaks a lot of necks, and nobody ever says, oh, gosh, he's so violent, or no one ever says, why do you write about strong men? Yeah. Um, but people do ask why I write about strong women, and they say, as a compliment, you write like a man. Oh, no. Um, which, I, I get that a lot. You and, write like a woman. Well, exactly, and the fact is that 83% of all book buyers, as you know, are yeah. women. Yep. We've been reading this for a really long time. Um, I think that it's, it's mostly men who are shocked and a little concerned mm -hmm. that we really like these books and, you know. The, Do you think it scares them? Um, I don't know. I think, um, I think some it must, mm -hmm. but you must have, when you're at a signing, sometimes a man will come up to you and say, I don't read books written by women. Yeah. And, uh, and you just say... And I just say, why? Right. Well, <laughs> gee, what are you missing? Yeah. But it's interesting because if a woman said that to a man, then you would just assume she was weak and, uh, or, yeah. you know, or, you know, a yeah. ball breaker. Oh, she or, couldn't take it. Or right, something. right. Or yeah. she hates men or, you know, all these horrible <laughs> things. But a man, you just yeah. think, meh. <laughs> um, but it, it really is an interesting dynamic. I can't complain too much, though, because I get a lot of attention for it. Yeah. Uh, and when I first started out, you know, I love Sarah Paretsky, I love Kinsey, uh, Kinsey Milholm, Sue Grafton, um, I, Sandra Brown, all these great women yeah. who are writing stories, but they're, they're lighter stories than what I write. I think yeah. that's a oh, fair they statement. Are. Yeah. And when they I are. started writing, it was Patricia Cornwell, Kathy Wrights, and me. Mm -hmm. And everybody was looking at us funny. Mm -hmm. And so now I think it's really great that women can write these stories and you know, you know, people are really happy about it. Um, yeah. Not to have boundaries around what you can do. Exactly. Or try to do. Exactly. Oh, that's... Uh, one thing I, I do get asked about the Steve Larson books a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, because I think I asked you about he's that. He's held as this great tonight. feminist because <laughs> yeah. he created this 
character who is a strong woman who does things men want strong women to do. Mm -hmm. uh, like she doesn't feel fulfilled until she gets breast implants. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, th that sort of thing, uh, I, I think, disqualifies you. I have a feeling you're not going to have a breast implant no, in your No, no. Well, let's please not talk about my breasts there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, I, as a woman, I think it, what bothers me is when men get really raised up for writing about strong women. Yeah. Because women have been doing it forever. Yeah. You know, Flannery O'Connor. Oh, Mary Shelley, uh, you yeah. can go back in time, and um, there are just so many great women writers. But when women write about women, they're writing cozies or they're writing um, chiclet. And when men write about families and struggles and think domesticity and that, they're writing really important literature. Mm -hmm. So there yeah. is a big difference. Oh yeah, and women are limited too. So many women try to do other things, but they're they're put in those little boxes of writing the cozies or writing something light, not what you get to write. Yeah, I feel really lucky. You know, I remember my first signing, and you probably get this. Someone comes and says, "Hey, do you remember me? We went to high school together." Mm -hmm. um, and you think, "Well, there's a reason why." We didn't talk after high school. Um, and uh, this woman came to me and she said, do you remember me? We were in kindergarten together. And I thought, that, that's just not fair. And she said, I remember you. Because when the teacher came around and asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up, and the teachers in here know that you're looking for ideas. You're, you don't care what the, the kids want to be. Um, but she said, you and I are the only two people who said then what we actually are now. And you wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to be divorced from a wealthy man. <laughs> and I said, Sheila? So who won in that one? <laughs> well, she did it twice, so she's a lot better at it than she uh, gave herself credit for. I guess that's something to shoot for. Uh, <laughs> or literally shoot for. Exactly. <laughs> Your characters are so amazing. I'm, I'm just drawn to their, your women especially, but all your characters. And your stories are not light. They're not, they don't slide across the surface at any point, any of the structure or anything. Nothing is easy. It's not done easy. How the heck do you do one a year? I don't know. Oh, uh, you know, it used to be easier, just the physical act of sitting that long now. Mm -hmm. I'm like a creaky old woman when I get up. Um, I, I love it so much. I just get into a zone. And, and there are so very few people who get to do for a living what they want to do. Yeah. And so I feel very um, fortunate in that regard. Yeah. And I, when I think about my characters, you know, I, I think of books in series. So um, even as I was working on Cop Town, I was thinking of the one coming after that and the one with Will Trent that comes after that and what's happening with him and Sarah. And I'm always writing myself notes. And I'm thinking of details that I think will be interesting, you know? And I mean, just uh, today I was at um, a restaurant and someone used the tail of their shirt to open a bottle and I thought, boy, I bet that's a clue Sarah might find in somebody's shirt, don't mm -hmm. you dare use it. Um, <laughs> where, you know, their shirt's torn and so she knows that he's right-handed and she knows, you know, so yeah. I thought that would, you know, so things like that are yeah. always in my mind. and. I think, when I think about these characters, I think about them as people I know. Yeah, well, and, they must be by now. And Well, and that was the great challenge of Cop Town because it is easier to write series characters mm -hmm. because you have a shorthand with them and you have all these exciting secrets about them that you want to tell people or not tell people. Yeah. Or, and, and I love that, but I needed to challenge myself. Um, I got bored with my Grant County books. If you know how they end, please don't tell anyone um, because I need to sell those books still. Um, but um, I, I don't want to be in a position where I'm doing what I could, I could actually do, which is just sling out a book and they'd give me some money and, you know, the quality goes down and down and down. And I'm sure your guys are thinking of some of your favorite authors who have done this. And you can really tell they're bored. And yeah. I want to keep challenging myself because I didn't do this so that I could get money or get famous or any of the other stuff. N not that I'm complaining about that. I did it because I love writing. And, it, and writing is something that you don't choose. It chooses you. Yeah. And I feel very lucky when I'm writing these books that How I How do you do feel that. when you can't write, when you're out doing these things? How do you feel? Actually, it's a good break for me. Oh, good. And I'm, you know, I'm a, I write in spurts. I, I can't stop doing that. It worked for me when I uh, was, uh, had a real job and now it works for me where I, I have a cabin in the North Georgia mountains and I go up there 
and I just sit down and it's just me and the characters and what I want to do in the book and I do stay up there for two or three weeks at a time and my father's right down the street so he'll bring me chocolate cake and tell me to bathe Aww. and things like that Aww. yeah Aww. he takes good care of me <laughs> and um, you know one thing my dad uh, is not a big reader um, like Will, the dyslexia runs in our family, and, oh. um, but uh, and he also thinks that um, reading is sort of a waste of time. He oh. doesn't understand it. He grew up very poor, and uh, is you know, he kind of a mountain man? If you're up he there, he sort of mountain. is. Um, but it tickled him no end when I was a reader, and um, oh. my sisters. I'm the youngest of three are still ticked off because I'm the only one he saved money for to go to college Oh my! <laughs> because gosh. I was a reader and then I dropped out of college so he still hasn't forgiven me for that even though he went to Vegas with the money but whatever <laughs> um, but he grew up very poor and the only entertainment was telling stories and so they they told people each other stories he had nine brothers and sisters uh -huh. his father was an awful awful man he was so bad um, at taking care of his family that the clan kicked him out um, and uh, the, the cake, the, that yeah, plan? yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> Who knew they had standards? Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, th that's how they kept each other company. And he was always telling us stories. And you know, my grandmother loved telling stories on people. Gossiping is a Southern tradition, um, and it's considered the most rude thing you can do. But everybody wants to know what you know about everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in a church last night. Um, in uh, Dallas uh, for this big author series, Authors Live. I missed my plane, I wasn't very live. Um, but um, I was thinking about when I was little and my grandmother would take me to church and everybody had a story. You know, she would introduce me to Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones and as soon as the woman turned her back, she'd say, well, you know she's a drinker. Uh, or you know her husband's cheating on her. And so all my characters have these really rich backstories because, you know, I, th I don't think of them as just, oh, the nice lady in the hat. I think, well, what's she hiding? Yeah, right. Your grandmother gave you that. Absolutely. And, and, and did you have the thing of, well, bless your heart? Absolutely. And you knew the knife was going in your exactly. back? Exactly. Yeah, oh. yeah. Bless your heart is a shorthand for... Um, you're really stupid, and I'm making fun of you. Um, but uh, you have to use it the right way. My grandmother was a master of that. Was she? Yeah. Did you live with your grandmother? No, I lived with uh, my dad and my stepmother. Um, but okay. she visited a lot, um, which is why I had a stepmother instead of my mother. Um, and uh, <laughs> and she, she was a great lady, though. Um, and and she, read, she read True Crime Magazine. Do you remember that True Crime Magazine? Yeah, sure. It's like snuff porn. Um, and there was always a woman on the cover looking over her shoulder, terrified, and the headline said her husband was right or, you know, she should have listened to her father. And um, she, she would have to go to the Piggly Wiggly on the back side of town to get this magazine because mm -hmm. they didn't sell it at our Winn-Dixie. Uh, and so every Sunday she would go to her church, which my parents didn't want me to go to because they were one generation from snake handling. Oh. And she would go to church, and then she would go to, to the Piggly Wiggly and get the True Crime ma magazine. Mm -hmm. She would go home, and she would read it while she was cooking Sunday supper. And then she, w she would hear us coming up the driveway, and she would hide it under her chest of drawers. And so as soon as we got there, my sisters and I went, and we looked under her chest of drawers. <laughs> and our, our parents thought we were just awful people who were terrified of the fire and brimstone uh, that we got at the, the church. But it was really the True Crime magazine that scared us that night, and we couldn't sleep. Um, but one Christmas I, I thought, well, what, wouldn't it be great if we gave my grandmother True Crime Magazine a subscription so she didn't oh, have to go to yeah. the Piggly Wiggly? Yeah. <laughs> and so we gave it to her and she opened it up and, you know, it, my dad explained to her what it is. It's a subscription and she burst into tears. Uh, she wept and she said, I do not want the postman to know I read that. And so my dad called True Crime Magazine the next day to cancel it. And apparently this had happened before because they charged him a subscription price to cancel it. Uh -huh. So he had to pay twice for her not to get it. Uh -huh. And then she went to the store and still got it. <laughs> Typical Southern, isn't exactly. it? Is that what it was like in your town, the, the women all kind of backbiting and knowing secrets about each other? Yes, and the men would sit there and go, 
you shouldn't gossip, but they wanted to hear every single word of it. Oh, I betcha. But that's a tradition of stories, and you come from storytellers. Mm -hmm. If your grandfather or your father would sit yeah. out there and have that oral tradition. So you must have this going on in your head. You probably couldn't have avoided being a writer, could you? Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's like you, I imagine, that it, even if someone wasn't publishing you, you'd still be writing. Oh, you'd have to write. Yeah. yeah. I've been writing for years and didn't get published, and now it's, it's different, but still. I couldn't stop writing, and my poor husband knows that I turn into the worst, I'll use the W word, witch, when I'm not writing because I just, there's too much going on. It's like your head's mm -hmm. going to explode. I'm the same way. Once you start getting all those characters up here, it's like you've got all these people living, and oh my God. It's true. Well, that's why I have to get away, because I'm just awful to be around, and <laughs> I can't car carry on a conversation. Oh, I know. It, it, it is tough. <laughs> Um, can you tell us how you start a book? How you get, uh, for the writers in the audience too, how do you start a book and force yourself to keep going? Because there's that point at about, what, four, five, six, seven chapters when you think, this is crap. I'm not going to go on with it. Well, what I think is, oh God, it's going to be a short story. <laughs> 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 and then I get to a few more, and I'm like, oh, God, it's going to be a novella. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a great honor to know that someone is going to publish your book. Yeah, I know. That takes probably 90% of the stress off. Yeah. Uh, but then you get 95% added back because they want it on a deadline. Yeah. <laughs> and my deadline is um, the first of the year, so I have the busiest fall ever, um, where I, that's where I do the majority of my writing. I used to feel guilty about it because I thought, oh, you're procrastinating, you should write it in January and then you have the whole year and it just doesn't work out that way because I need, that's part of my process is thinking about uh, the characters and what they're going to do. But a book usually starts with, do, do I want to do um, something different? Because now that I've done a standalone, I've done a standalone a couple of times, the last yeah. one turned into a series. Yeah. Do I want to do something like that? Do I want to talk about Will and Sarah? Do I have a story for them? Mm -hmm. um, or I'll see a crime. And usually, you know, there's not a new way to murder someone, um, which is really awful. Because, um, you know, as a crime writer, you want to um, come up with something new. But, we're, we, you know, I wrote a book one year about women who were kidnapped and held for a year by this mm -hmm. guy. And then uh, Fritzl in Austria was you know, exposed and he's got his whole family in a basement and none of them have ever seen daylight. And you just think, I could never come up with something that awful. It just yeah. wouldn't occur to me, which I and guess is why I'm not a killer. people probably wouldn't believe you if exactly. you wrote that. It's and, just too terrible. And I talk to police officers all the time. Um, they always talk about cases and things. And, and a lot of times it is too unbelievable. I couldn't put it in a story. Mm -hmm. um, or I have to change details. I change many details because I don't want to take someone's awful experience and then basically, uh, you know, use it, use it for yeah. entertainment. Yeah. Um, so I take different things from different crimes, but mm -hmm. the first chapter is very important to me. Uh, usually when I finish, if it's going to be a Will and Sarah book, when I finish writing the last book, I'll write the first chapter of the next book. Oh, that's smart. Well, I want the, the tone to be the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that, unless everybody on Facebook lies, I'm aware that a lot of people will, before a new book comes out, they'll read all the past ones. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be seamless and to yeah. make sense. Yeah. Um, because that, that's important to me, that these yeah. readers really get what they want out of the books. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that first, story, first chapter, it's really easy because something bad happens. Mm -hmm. The hard part is figuring out, okay, well, not just who did it, but why did they do it? Because I play very fair with my readers. Um, you always meet the bad guy. It's not the butler in the, on the last page and you know, with the, the carpet knife or whatever. Um, so I have to be very careful to make sure every single character has some sort of story. Otherwise you would say, well, the, the really developed guy we don't know much about, that must be the killer. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to hide him in plain sight. You have to find the, the people that people suspect. And then you have to be aware that from probably page two, there are people who are just going to know who did it and they're going to be really happy about that, but you, they have to be compelled to keep reading to find out that why, mm -hmm. even if they think they know who did it. Yeah. Um, so it's really a balancing trick, and I do have that panic of, oh, it's going to be a short story, or, you know, what do I do? 
and I talk to my editor, and she'll say, just kill somebody, kill somebody else, you know, <laughs> uh, like it's that easy. Um, but I, I, th that figuring out, you know, everybody has a great idea for a book, and they're really great ideas. That is such an easy thing to do, though. Yeah, I know. It's sitting down, figuring out how the characters are going to tell the story, how the plot's going to move along, how you're going to trick people, how you're going to make people care. Yeah. Because um, you can have a great plot, but if nobody cares about the characters, they're not going to read it. And, you know, you can have great characters, but no plot, and then you're not writing a thriller. Do you get angry when they tell you, oh, I knew who it was in the second chapter? Well, I wonder if they're being truthful. I think, okay, they probably have a good idea, mm -hmm. but then throughout the book, maybe they were thinking, oh, maybe I'm wrong, yeah. or, you know, but, but, you know, some people just do, and I'm not good at that. I don't figure it out very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not, when I read a book, I'm not trying to figure out who the person is. I'm just trying to enjoy the book and, you yeah. know, I don't, yeah. I don't think of it in terms of a, a puzzle I need to figure out. I guess it's because I do that for a living. So yeah. when yeah. I want to relax and read something, then, you know, I, I, I just try to get do angry that. if they can, t if they tell me they know in the second chapter, I feel I've really screwed up somewhere. Oh, see, I don't think that. Good. Because you can't fool everybody. Hmm. And some of them are liars. Yeah, so. that's, <laughs> that's what I'll tell myself. And next some time. of them, I mean, you can tell this. Somebody will be really smug about it. Well, I figured it out, and you think, no, you didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, I have more friends than you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know so much in your books. Your research just floored me. I mean, you know everything about the guns. You know everything about hospital routine. You know everything about a cop's daily routine. You know everything about everything. How the heck do you do that? Well, I know it when I'm writing the book, but it's like the SATs. You're never going to be that smart ever again in your life. Um, but can't you save it to use in other books? I did. Well, I wrote a book a couple of books ago called Criminal that took place in the 1970s. And, and that book started with a very clear question for me because Will Trent has a boss named Amanda Wagner. And she's in her mid-60s, and she's just a ball breaker. And she's a police officer, and she came up in the 70s. And I thought, why is she so awful? Because we all know women like that who, you know, they, when they get to the top, they pull the ladder up after them. And if they see a woman come, come behind them, they kind of kick them in the head. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, let me, let me really explore why she's that way. And I started talking to women police officers who started their work in the 1970s. And I thought, my God, no wonder they are so ticked off. Yeah. And no wonder they think women today have it so easy because they do, comparatively speaking. Um, and for this, for Cop Town, I, I spoke to them for hours about the hazing they went through. Um, you know, they would open their locker and there was a pile of feces in there. Or they would get behind their squad car and there was some DNA samples in the squad car from the men that they had left there. Lovely. And they were groped and they were pushed around. It was very physical um, on the part of the men because they just thought, well, okay, if you're going to be a cop, you can't be a woman anymore and I'm going to push you and push you and push you. Some men, as I said before, you know, power, I believe, is not taken, it's given. Mm -hmm. There were some men who said, well, okay, well, women actually are good at this job. They do know what they're doing. We mm -hmm. should give them a chance. Um, they do have families to support just like we do. You know, they're not just here for the lark. Um, but I, these women really had to put up with a lot of crap. And I, I remember talking to them. We were at a coffee shop, and we were laughing our asses off just at the crazy things they went through. And I got back home, and I was looking through my notes, and I thought, oh, my God, this is so horrible. Uh, they had made jokes of all of it. But, you know, one woman, her boss threw a phone at her head. And remember when phones used to be really heavy, and you paid $5 a month for them? It dented the wall, but he threw it at her head because he was so mad at her because she had told him that she wasn't going to go out with him. He, he was married uh -huh. uh, and actually 30 years older. Uh, another woman, she was almost raped by uh, her boss. He drove her home from work, and out in the, the front of her house, he tried to rape her. And at the time, Atlanta had, uh, and a lot of major cities had these. Uh, they weren't Black Panthers. They were sort of an offshoot, a kinder, mm -hmm. general, general, generally... Um, nonviolent offshoot, but they police the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and uh, they wore the berets and that sort of thing, and if they saw criminals, they put a stop to it, and they actually saved her from being raped by her boss. Oh, my gosh. Um, and, you know, as bad as the men were, the women could be even more horrible, um, and, you know, in, in, when talking to these people, I realized, okay, 
The men and the women were horrible to the new recruits, but being a cop is not an easy thing. And Maggie even says this in the beginning of the book when Kate, on her first day, is being hazed by the women in the locker room. You know, she's run the gauntlet through the men, and then the women just treat her uh, like a rag muffin and punch her around. And Maggie says if she can't handle it, this in the locker room, then she can't handle it in the street. And that's yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, my heavens. Those women went through things. Uh, but at, that was actually in almost all professions. I mean, women, yeah. have, well, until they've got the right to, to sue and uh, not have to live with that in their workplace. Well, the women who sued, though, their careers were stymied. Mm -hmm. But the women who were around the women who sued, they managed to move up. All mm -hmm. the women I spoke with who started out in these really dire situations, they um, retired with honors captains, majors, um, mm -hmm. with very good rank. Wow. Um, one of them was a um, consultant during the Olympic bombing with the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, so they really have made amazing lives for themselves. The one thing I asked every single one of them was, why did you become a police officer? Because this was a time when, as I said, nobody wanted them to be cops, their mothers especially, because they said, no man will marry you. Um, and even today, female police officers had a hard time finding men um, who aren't intimidated by the fact that she can throw them to the ground and handcuff them, not in the good way. Um, but, you know, it was a really radical choice. We're not far removed from a time when husbands and fathers could have their daughters and wives institutionalized for being yeah. crazy and wanting rights and wanting to do things and being, you know, sexual or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, 1972, the appeal uh, was approved legally for un unmarried women. Before mm -hmm. that, you had to prove you were married. Yeah. Um, this was a time when women were still discriminated in housing, couldn't get credit cards, couldn't get bank accounts, all, unless they had a man's approval. My own grandmother, um, when my father was 22 years old, uh, and she finally got rid of my grandfather, she had to get my 22-year-old father to co-sign a lease for her so mm -hmm. she could rent a house. Mm -hmm. Or um, get loans or anything. They had yeah. to have a man who would sign for them. Exactly. And so this is the world they were in. It's, I asked them, why would you do this? And to, to a one, they all had some variation on the answer of, because someone told me not to. I see a lot of oh, men wow. nodding their heads. But that's, the, you know, one woman, she went downtown. She wanted to be, she was a Kelly girl and she wanted to be a secretary. And at the time, if you wanted to work for the government, which she did, you went to one building and you filled out an application mm -hmm. and then they called you back for an interview. So she went downtown and she went into the wrong room. There was a police officer there. And he said, this is applications for the police force. And uh, she said, okay, you know, okay. And he said, well, little lady, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. And she said, I absolutely do. And she grabbed the application and she sat down and. She was filling it out, and she was thinking, God, I'm going to have to come back here tomorrow. And, you know, she gave it to him, and she left, and she went home, and the phone rang, and they had called her back for an interview. <laughs> and she thought, oh, God, well, they'll arrest me for wasting police time if I don't go to the interview. <laughs> and surely when I get there, they'll realize I can't be a police officer. And <laughs> so she went to the interview and, um, you know, answered all the questions and all that, and then she went home. And again, the phone rang, and they said, be at the police academy on Monday. She hadn't even told her husband. Uh, and so she went to the police academy because her husband told her not to. And um, <laughs> she kept thinking, I'm going to wash out. You know, they're going to tell me I don't belong here. She's one of the women who um, consulted with the FBI eventually. Um, but that's why she was there, because uh, someone said she didn't belong. You have. Um um, a lot of corrupt cops, especially in cop town. Um, do you have problems driving through Georgia? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't. Um, I write about Will Trent, and Will Trent is a cop, mm -hmm. and he's a good guy. Yeah. Um, he's, and, and he's a good cop, and, and his partner Faith is, and I, so I do balance it out. Um, and the, the fact is corrup corruption is more interesting to write about. People think they want to read about happiness and, you know, everybody doing what they're supposed to do. And, I mean, even the Bible has people who mess up. So uh, there's a reason why we have to have corrupt cops in books, especially. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a big proponent of uh, supporting the police. Mm -hmm. um, I think they do a thankless, like teaching. They do a very thankless job. They're taking their lives into their own hands, like yeah. teaching. 
Um, and, you know, the, the stories that I tell mostly come from police officers mm -hmm. because they want to help. And when an author says, hey, I need some help, they, you know, they tell a story and they, they see such fascinating things and they think in such a different way. I know there's some lawyers in the room and I know going to law school changes how, not just who you are, but how you think about things, how you look at things. That's the whole point of that is to structure your mind in a way that, that thinks about the law. And for police officers, it, it completely changes the structure of their minds toward being police officers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just amazing to me to hear their perspective on things. And mm -hmm. some of them, you know, they're, they're not all redneck, hillbilly, racist, blah, 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 you know? A lot of them have very liberal leanings. A lot of them have quirks and, you know, they're just normal human beings. Um, but one thing they share is they there is definitely an us versus them. Yeah, and I think any you know the military you see that, and and oh, there's sure. a reason. It's a teachers you see that. I mean, God, I would never want to be in a, a teacher's room when the teachers are together talking about the students. No, you probably never send your kids to school. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you when you deal with the cops, did. Was it hard to get them to open up at the beginning, or were they only too happy to because they knew you were a writer? Well, my um, stepmother's sister was a chief of detectives oh. when I was growing up. Mm. And so she had a lot of interesting stories that she told. And my father is one of those good old boys in Georgia, and he knows a lot of people, and he knew the Speaker of the House for the state of Georgia who said, oh, well, you should talk to so-and-so at the Georgia Bureau of oh. Investigation. And I called him up, and, the, and it was the director of communications, and he said, I was hoping you would call me because I have a Google alert for the GBI, and I keep hearing about this agent, Will Trent, and I can't find him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they, um, they, did, they let me go on training exercises and you know, all this stuff and, t and see the crime lab, which actually is kind of boring because it's just machines. Um, but the people there are fascinating, and, and you know, I... I'm a kind of person who says yes to everything, um, which got me in a lot of trouble in high school, but we won't talk about that. Um, and we were passing by the morgue and they said, hey, do you want to see an autopsy? And I said, yes. And then I thought, oh no, um, because I had always resisted seeing an autopsy because I thought I don't want to take a very real awful situation and then write about it, you know, just as some goofy crime writer, mm -hmm. right? And I quickly realized that was not possible because it was so solemn. There, there wasn't the joking you always see on TV and, you know, they were very, um, it was almost religious in their respect and it was fascinating and, and I think it informed my writing in a different way. Mm -hmm. And it, it brought home how real it is because one thing I say, and I know there are writers in the room and hopefully you all want to be crime writers because that's the best writer. Um, <laughs> You have to always remember, even when you're writing very lightly about crime, that these are things that happen to people every day. You know, there are rapes, there are murders, there are rapes and rapes and rapes. There are, I mean, all these things are happening. And you need to be aware that someone might pick up your book and take the treatment of, your treatment of this crime, your light treatment, and be offended by it. Um, and so I always try to be respectful of that and remember that these are real people who have this stuff happen. I uh, once mentioned at a signing that I wanted to go to an autopsy and this gentleman in all this black stuff he had on, he kind of sidled up to me and he says, uh, I can get you into an autopsy. And I thought, well, that was the best offer I'd had in a long, long time. <laughs> And then I chickened out. I just I thought, oh, I'm going to go in and make a fool of myself. I'm going to hit the floor. I won't be able to do it. So you did it. That's, I did. That took us. Well, and I had people, men come up and say that to me. And my first question is, are you affiliated with the uh, coroner in, in any way? Or is this just something you do for a hobby? Or <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, it, it was difficult, but I th I, again, I think it was a, a good experience, mm -hmm. if there can be a good experience from something like that. Yeah, but it's something of knowledge. Well, yeah, Who was exactly. it? Michelangelo had to, had to know what the body was mm -hmm. made of, and, and you, you almost needed that reverence, that sense of reverence to know you don't do it lightly. You, most of the things ha around death, you try not to do lightly. They're there, and they're horrible. And you certainly portray it as horrible, 
but there's still the reverence there. There's still someone's going to be sorry. Someone feels horrible. Mm -hmm. um, just at the beginning of, well, I better not talk too much about Captown. I don't want to give anything away because sometimes I do that. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I kill people for a living, too, mm -hmm. the same as you do. And we do have a murderous nature. Mm -hmm. Mine came from when I was about six years old, and I was riding my bike down Filer Street in Detroit, and at the end of the street was what we called the jungle, because it was all trees and stuff. And I got down there, and this man leaped out from behind a tree with his raincoat on and opened his raincoat and showed his very inadequate business there. And I um, got off my bike and I threw my bike at him and I ran home. And then later that day, my dad went with me to get my bike back and the frame was all bent. And, oh. and this was my brother's bike that had been passed down to me. You know, I've been mad at that creep ever since. <laughs> Every time I kill somebody in one of my books, there's a little bit of him in there that I'm doing all over again. Good Do you have you. anything like that? You know, I don't. It, it, I will, as a, a, a side to that story, I have never met a woman who hasn't been flashed or had something inappropriate of that nature happen to her. Oh, yeah. I was at a, a, um, a, a luncheon for a bunch of booksellers, and there were 20 of us. And I don't, I don't know why. I guess that yes, all women thing was, yeah. and we were all talking about that. It's where women go onto Twitter and post horrible things that have happened to them, like, you know, from the extreme of being sexually assaulted to just not being able to walk down the street, um, to having to make up a phone number because, you know, you're terrified if you give the guy your number, he'll call you, and you don't want him to call you, but if you say no, that he'll get mad at you, and, you know, yeah. so, and, and every single one of us had, I, I, I was a kid, too, when I, we went on a field trip into Atlanta, and at that time, Atlanta was a lot scarier than it is now. And we were on the big bus, and we were, I was looking out the window, and there was a homeless man, and he saw all the kids, and he just pulled down his pants and started to urinate. And I said, oh, look, a penis. <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my kindergarten teacher just went, and she went to all the windows, and she was hitting the windows like that would stop it. Look away, children, look away. Oh, yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't think about killing him, mostly because he was old then, so he's probably dead now. Yeah, um, I know. Well, mine's long gone, too, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. But I keep doing him in. Or worse, he's still living in Detroit. Oh, my God. <laughs> then I couldn't go back there. Oh, no, he's dead. Oh, okay. I've taken little pieces through every one of the books. He's got to be gone. But you're right. I don't know a woman who hasn't had something like that. Uh, in a movie theater, I was just a little girl because I remember I had snow pants on. Some guy came in and sat down next to me and put his hand down inside my snow pants. And I sat there scared to death until he left. And then I was 16, and some guy tried that on me in a theater in downtown Detroit, and I stood up, and I kicked him, and I chased him up the aisle. <laughs> he went out the, into the street on Woodward and fell in the gutter, and that was the first time I turned around and let him go. But it just, there's some, I wonder if that's why I want to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little nervous myself. I'm still mad about these yeah. things. <laughs> You said it was women who mostly read these, our books too, the, yeah, mi the mysteries, book. and, and they're 80% of the book buying public. Why do you think women especially are interested in crime? What is it that attracts them? Is it because of this, a kind of powerlessness that maybe we give them something to hang on to? Or is it um, a way of facing evil and not having to live with it in your life? What is it? Because they're drawn to that. Well, I think it's a, a different things for different women. Some are just judgmental and they think, well, that will never happen to me. Oh. Um, I think that as human beings, we're wired to mark dangerous things, you know, and that's how we learn to survive is knowing what the dangerous things are. Um, I just think that goes into, I think that for men, they, a lot of men choose different ways to unwind. Um, for women, for so many years, it's not like we could go out and play a game of touch football. It was just, we could read or we could do housework. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, men have more social things they do. They're pack animals. They like to go out and do stuff. And yeah. um, women, especially women who have children, would like nothing more than to lock their children out and read a book for a few hours. Oh, yeah. Um, because it is a, it, 
I think as women, we're not really wired to take time for ourselves because mm -hmm. it seems selfish, mm -hmm. especially if we have families. And so if you're reading a book, you actually feel like you are accomplishing something, yeah. but you're also giving yourself a gift. Yeah, um, that's true. And I think that, you know, I think it's great that, to me, when I meet a guy who reads books, one, I think it's very sexy mm -hmm. um, because it says a lot about his personality. Mm -hmm. um, and two, I think, they seem just much more relaxed, don't they? Yeah, they do. Um, and I think it's because um, there's something that happens if, if you know anyone in the audience or you has a, a raised a young boy. I saw this with my nephew. He loved reading until he got to be 10 or 11, and then he was told only girls read. And so he never picked up another book again. Uh, what um, a tragedy. I know, and uh. that happens a lot. And, and for some boys, they just, you know, there are so many other things to do. And mm -hmm. my, especially at that age, my God, they're just teeming with hormones. They'll explode if they sit down for that long. Mm -hmm. um, and they start to really smell, so maybe it's best they're not in libraries. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I think that, it, that reading is a gift you give yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of focus and patience to sit and read a book and kind of release yourself into the story because mm -hmm. what you're saying is I'm going to trust this author to kind of play in my head for a little while yeah and to be able to let go is a big thing and I think that for many women it's easier to do that well you know what we have the ultimate experience because we get to create that world and we get to go live there and I know I can be at a party and I just get a drink in my hand and a smile on my face and I go right back to my books and I'm thinking about what my characters are doing right then. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of schizophrenic though, isn't it? Well, I don't know because I haven't known anything else. Oh. I got into, <laughs> in school I was constantly in trouble for daydreaming and now um. I get paid for it. So. <laughs> That's great. I want to go back to your books for a minute because I want to talk about Will Trent. Mm -hmm. Who the heck is this guy? He's, he's, He's with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. He's always undercover. I mean, deep undercover. And uh, he doesn't get along with women really well. Who was he and who is he? Well, he wants to get along with women, but he, he doesn't get along. He, unfortunately, he works for a lot of women or in with a lot of women. Yeah. And he doesn't have many social skills. And women are more likely to call him on it. And men are more likely to say, well, he's just strange. We could still get a beer with him. Um, you know, so it, Will is someone who grew up in foster care. He oh, aged yeah. out of the system. Um, he has dyslexia very badly. And um, he grew up thinking this meant that something really was wrong with him and that he wasn't very smart. And it's really informed him as, as an adult because, you know, he's a police officer in, in all respects. And he understands criminals because criminals are hiding something and so is Will. Mm. Um, but, you know, he, he, as a woman, I love reading books about relationships, um, and I got really tired of reading about women who were in crappy relationships with men, mm -hmm. and so I thought, well, let me write about a man who's in a crappy relationship with a woman, mm -hmm. and his girlfriend is just awful. Um, we meet her in Triptych and Fractured, and her name is Angie Pulaski, and she grew up in uh, the children's home with him, and she's just awful to him. Um, and when I started writing Triptych, which is the first book of Will Trent, I knew that my Grant County series was going to end and that I knew, I knew that Sarah Linton would eventually meet Will Trent. And so Triptych and Fractured, which are the f two books he has without her, I was working on making him the sort of man that she would be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's important. You know, we've, we've done a lot of um, talking about how great women are. I think we should talk about how great men can be. Oh, heck yeah. Um, I'm married to a really good one. It, the one who groped you in the theater? No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I did find another one. Oh, okay, one. <laughs> okay. Um, but he is a great guy, and, you know, he is fictional. He does the laundry and washes dishes. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's, um, he doesn't feel sorry for himself. No. And for m most people in foster care end up being in the care of the government as adults. There's an 80% chance they'll be arrested. And if you're arrested, there's something like a 70% chance you'll be arrested again. Mm -hmm. And so he's someone who has really fought what would be destiny for him. Um, and, he, and we find out in Criminal that he's had a little help along the way that he didn't know about. Yeah. Um, but I love, I love the character. I think he's, um, he's really great. When I think about him, I think about Lee Child because 
I, I had written about a character in Grant County who was tall and dark and handsome and all these things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I can't write another character who's dark and handsome and all that. So I need a, someone with blonde hair. And Lee has blonde hair. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, but I don't want him to go bald. Because uh, he has so much to worry about, I don't want him to worry about that. Because a lot of men with blonde hair get thin. Yeah. And so I, I, I went to breakfast once with Lee, and he got there because he's always ahead of me, because he gets there 10 minutes early. Um, and I looked, I, I could see him, and I looked at the back of his hair, and it was really thick. And I thought, okay, well, I can make Will have thick blonde oh, hair. Oh, good. Um, so I'm that, glad you're we, not going to have him be bald on top <laughs> of everything else. Well, you don't see a lot of that happen, do you? Um, where uh, a woman writes a book about the, the, the bald guy who's the hero. Oh, no. Yeah. No, I guess not. That's well, the, men don't write it either, so let's be honest about that. Yeah, but that. there's a lot of really sexy bald guys. That's true. So. Well, uh, Telly Savalas. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, also, your female characters. You mentioned Sarah Linton. She's a doctor. She's a pediatrician, part-time medical examiner, mm -hmm. and um, and now she is getting together with Will Trent. And this is a bumpy one too. And Lena, Lena Adams. The two of them are sort of at each other's throats all mm -hmm. the time. Um, could you talk about them and why this battle continues? Well, they knew each other in Grant County, and something really bad happened at the end of the Grant County series that you probably you can figure out, but I'm not going to say. Um, and Sarah blames Lena for that. Yeah. Uh, and and Lena's a cop. Oh, Lena's she's a, a detective. Cop. She's a detective. Yeah. And, you know, Lena's this sort of um, person who is very angry, and throughout the Grant C County books, you see her evolve, um, and she grows up, and she learns from her mistakes, and but she still keeps making new ones. Mm -hmm. And so she's a character I, I think, uh, you know, I always want to keep checking in on with her. And Unseen, I checked in with her to see where she was. And mm -hmm. she's sort of getting her life together. She's married. Um, you know, I, I'm a really big believer that people who meet the right people become better mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. um, and if they meet the wrong ones, they become worse. Mm -hmm. And Lena has a tendency to be drawn to the bad people. Um, but in Unseen, she's finally kind of getting her life straight. And the thing I love about Unseen is if you've never read Grant County or any of the other books, you go into this without any knowledge of Lena. And you don't know if what Sarah is saying about her being an awful per person is true or if what Lena is saying about how she's kind of a good person is true. And I love playing with that. Um, but Sarah's not the only one who thinks of her as a typhoid Mary. That well, everyone no. who comes into Lena's area dies. Well, she does, well, it is a thriller, so you know, I do have to have people <laughs> die. Um, but the people she works with don't know the old Lena, they just know the new oh. Lena. And so they have a lot of faith in her. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, and we had talked about this earlier, there's a scene where they confront each other, and I didn't yeah. want it to be like, you know, the typical... This is the maternity ward. Yeah. And I didn't want it to be a cat fight. I thought, I want them to really fight the way women fight, which is... Oh, you did. ...really psychologically nasty, <laughs> you know? But you know what? I thought, oh boy, here comes the big dewy kiss and makeup scene, and I was all ready for them to be just great <laughs> friends from near on yeah. in, and you didn't do that. No. You didn't let me have it. Sorry. Why do you take the really tough road all the time? Well, it's, it's more interesting to me, and it felt more realistic because these are characters who are who may have some peace with each other but yeah. they're never going to be best friends they're no. never there's always going to be that thing between them and I'm fascinated by relationships between women um, and this is another thing I think that male writers with rare exception I think Lee Child is great at writing women Wally Lamb uh, Peter Robinson um, because they look at the characters the way they look at their other characters which is as human beings and as instead of projections and with Sarah and Lena, I wanted to make sure that they were true to their characters. Uh, and the thing about women when they fight, they know how to devastate each other. Um, I've talked about school teachers a lot. One of my best friends is a school teacher, and she was um, in charge of discipline at her school. She was an assistant principal. And the rule was if two boys were fighting, you know, send in the coaches to break them up. If two girls were fighting, stand back and just let them do it because you can get really hurt. When girls decide to fight, mm. they want to kill each other. Uh, when boys fight, you know, after they, they know they can really hurt each other mm -hmm. and after a while they want somebody to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, but women, when they just get to that point, it just comes out. And 
I, so I wanted Sarah to be true to herself in this because she's not a nasty person, but Lena brings out that side of her. Mm -hmm. But she, in this scene, she feels sorry, and she says she's sorry about um, something that has happened to Lena. I don't know if I can say it, but anyway, something that just happened to Lena. <laughs> and I thought for sure, um, they, you know, it was like an opening yeah. to let them get together. Are they ever really, you said they're never going to be friends. I don't think so. I mean, I never say never, but I don't see that as a possibility. But I think it's a very adult thing to just accept that you're not going to get along with somebody. Yeah. And, to, and to, we have all got someone. Right. And you don't wish them ill. You don't want them to, like, get hit by a car. You just never want to see them again. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you don't sit around thinking how much you hate them. Uh, you just let it go. And I think that, you know, to, that to me, that's, that can also be what closure is. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, though I do love Oprah Winfrey, and I'm still upset that the show is off. Um, I think that sometimes the closure that you get from someone is just accepting that's yeah. how it is and I just need to move leave each on. other alone. Yeah, exactly. And pretend they're not alive. Yeah. That's probably yeah. the best way to get through it. Exactly. At least that's how I do it. The two, <laughs> the two protagonists in Cop Town, Maggie Lawson and Kate Murphy. Kate, tell us about how that difference is because that's, here's another two, two women who come together, but this time you do let them get a little closer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the thing is, I think that people can be very different as long as they have the same direction their moral compass points in. Well, that's a bad construction. Um, <laughs> you know, they have to have the same values. And you know, one can be an astronaut and the other one can be terrified of flying, but as long as they have the same values, I think that you can form a friendship with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what Kate and Maggie have. Um, they also have this situation where they're both in the same foxhole after a while. Yeah, that's true. And I think that brings them together. But Kate can't, comes from Buckhead, you know, she, and, and it's funny because a lot of people have said to me, well, why would someone who comes from a wealthy family want to be a police officer? And I thought, well, how insulting to police officers is that? Mm -hmm. Because they're not doing it because, uh, well, I can't be a janitor. I might as well be a police officer, you know? It's Harvard or this. Um, and for Kate, she has this sense of duty. Her parents um, are from the World War II generation. Uh, her mother and her grandmother were in Holland during World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, they were both in concentration camps. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to have that give Kate this sense of duty. Yeah. And, and through the book, she thinks about what her mother and grandmother went through, and she thinks, well, being a police officer, I can't quit. I could, yeah. They didn't have the luxury of quitting when it got hard, so I can't quit. That's right. And I think it gives her a backbone. Mm -hmm. um, and also, that's, that's what you sense in her, this strength. That, exactly. And, and you give her all the funny uniforms because they give her a hat that doesn't fit and it's always falling over her eyes, and she has shoes that she can't even wear, and, and you see her in all this, and you know that's not what she comes from, right. and she sticks it out. Yeah, one of the funny jokes they played on women was they would give them really big uniforms, uh, and they would give the black uh, male recruits very tiny ones. Um, so the women, they would put their uniform on and they get swallowed in it. There's actually a video on my website oh. um, that shows a, a female police officer from 1974 being interviewed, and they show her walking, and the breast pockets of her shirt are literally in her pants. <laughs> Um, and, and, but, you know, beyond that, just the equipment they wore, they had this flashlight called a Kell light. It was galvanized steel with four D-cell batteries, and they wore that on one side of their belt, and that was about 12 pounds. And then they had, you know, the handcuffs and the keys and the, the baton, which was a steel baton, and, and all of this, all of them had extraordinary back pain. Um, cops today, it, the, the equipment's lighter, but all of them have, you know, lower back problems, and they yeah. all have to stand with their legs wide, otherwise they'd fall over. Um, <laughs> but they, they literally have to wear a belt through their pants to hold their pants up, and then they put metal hooks through that belt and then put their utility belt on. So I, I have this opening scene where Kate's putting this uniform on and just feeling the weight of it, and, and this is what the women had to go through. And, one thing that I will tell you, I could never be a police officer because these women I spoke with, they were all in their 60s, they were retired, which if you want to know the truth about something, ask a retired 60-year-old woman. Um, but we talked for about six hours. 
That is the longest I have ever gone without using the bathroom. I thought I was going to have uremic poisoning. Uh, and they were fine. And then they drove home. They, they lived in Macon. They had like, I'm like, don't you need to go to the bathroom? No. Nope. And, and they just learned not to go because it was tantamount to admitting a weakness if you were in a squad car with a guy to say, I need to go to the bathroom. Oh, my God. And the guys would pull over on the side of the road and go, and they'd say to the women, why don't you go if you need to go? Yeah. Um, and so the, the, their response to this was just to... Um, develop bladder muscles like yeah. vices. Yeah. Well, teachers do that too. They call exactly. it a teacher's bladder because yeah. you can't get up in the middle of a class. Would you read something from Cobb sure. for us? I'll read the, from the last chapter where you find out who did it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Well, how about the first chapter? It's a prologue, actually. <clears throat> it's not that long, I don't think. They said read for five minutes. If anybody gets bored, just knock on your... Dawn broke over Peachtree Street. The sun razored open the downtown corridor, slicing past the construction cranes, waiting to dip into the earth and pull up skyscrapers, hotels, convention centers. Frost spiderwebbed across the parks. Fog drifted through the streets. Trees slowly straightened their spines. The wet, ripe meat of the city lurched toward the November light. The only sound was footsteps. Heavy slaps echoed between the buildings as Jimmy Lawson's police issue boots pounded the pavement. Sweat poured from his skin. His left knee wanted to give. His body was a symphony of pain. Every muscle was a plucked piano wire. His teeth gritted like a sandblock. His heart was a snare drum. The black granite equitable building cast a square shadow as he crossed Pryor Street. How many blocks had Jimmy gone? How many more did he have to go? Don Wesley was thrown over his shoulder like a sack of flour. Fireman's carry, harder than it looked. Jimmy's shoulder was ablaze. His spine drilled into his tailbone. His arm tripled from the effort of keeping Don's legs clamped to his chest. The man could already be dead. He wasn't moving. His head tapped into the small of Jimmy's back as he barreled down Edgewood faster than he'd ever carried the ball down the football field. He didn't know if it was Don's blood or his own sweat that was rolling down the back of his legs pooling into his boots. He wouldn't survive this. There was no way a man could survive this. The gun had snaked around the corner. Jimmy had watched it slither past the edge of a cinder block wall. The sharp fangs of the front sights jutted up from the tip of the barrel. Raven MP25, six round detachable box, blowback action, semi-auto. The classic Saturday night special, 25 bucks on any ghetto corner. That's what his, life, his partner's life had come down to, 25 bucks. Jimmy faltered as he ran past First Atlanta Bank. His left knee almost touched the asphalt. Only adrenaline and fear saved him from falling. Quick bursts of recall kept setting off colorful fireworks in his head. Red shirt sleeve bunched up around a yellow gold wristwatch. Black gloved hand holding the white pearl grip. The rising sun had bathed the weapon's dark steel in a bluish light. It didn't seem right that something black could have a glint to it, but the gun had almost glowed. And then the finger pulled back on the trigger. Jimmy knew the workings of a gun. The 25 slide was already racked, cartridge in the chamber. The trigger spring engaged the firing pin. The firing pin hit the primer. The primer ignited the gunpowder. The bullet flew from the chamber. The casing popped out of the ejection port. Don's head exploded. Jimmy's memory did no work to raise the image. The violence was etched into his corneas, backdrop every time he blinked. Jimmy was looking at Don, then he was looking at the gun, then he was looking at how the side of Don's face had distorted into the color and texture of a rotten piece of fruit. Click, click. The gun had jammed, otherwise Jimmy wouldn't be running down the street right now. He would be face down in an alley beside Don, condoms and cigarette butts and needles sticking to their skin. Gilmer Street, Cortland, Piedmont, three more blocks. His knee could hold out for three more blocks. Jimmy had never been on the business end of a firing gun. The flash was an explosion of starlight, millions of pinprick pieces of sunlight lighting up the dark alley. His eardrums rained with the sound. His eyes stung from the cordite. At the same time, he felt the splash against his skin like hot water, only he knew, he knew it was blood and bone and pieces of flesh hitting his chest, his neck, his face. He tasted it on his tongue, crunched the bone between his teeth. Don Wesley's blood, Don Wesley's bone. Jimmy was blind about, blinded by it. When Jimmy was a kid, his mother used to make him take his sister to the pool. 
She was so little back then, her skinny pale legs and arms poking out of her tiny suit reminded Jimmy of a baby praying mantis. In the water, he'd cup his hands together, tell her he'd caught a bug. She was a girl, but she loved looking at bugs. She'd paddle over to sea, and Jimmy would squeeze his hands together so the water would squirt into her face. She would scream and scream. Sometimes she would cry, but he'd still do it again the next time they were in the pool. Jimmy told himself it was all right because she kept falling for it. The problem wasn't that he was cruel. The problem was that she was stupid. <laughs> Where was she now? Safe in bed, he hoped. Fast asleep, he prayed. She was on the job, too, his little sister. It wasn't safe. Jimmy could end up carrying her through the streets one day. He could be jostling her limp body, careening around the corner, his knee brushing the blacktop as the torn ligaments clashed like cymbals. Jimmy saw a glowing sign ahead, a white field with a red cross in the center, Grady Hospital. He wanted to weep. He wanted to fall to the ground, but his burden would not lighten. If anything, Don got heavier. The last 20 yards were the hardest of Jimmy's life. A group of black men were congregating under the sign. They were dressed in bright purples and greens. Their tight pants flared below the knee, showing a touch of white patent leather, thick, th thick sideburns, pencil mustaches, gold rings on their fingers, Cadillacs parked a few feet away. The pimps were always in front of the hospital this time of morning. They smoked skinny cigars and watched the sun rise as they waited for the girls to get patched up for the morning rush hour. None of them offered to help the two bloody police officers making their way toward the doors. They gawked. Their cigarillos stopped midair. Jimmy fell against the glass doors. Someone had forgotten to lock them. They butterflied open. His knee slewed to the side. He fell face first into the emergency waiting room. The jolt was like a bad tackle. Don's hip bone knifed into his chest. Jimmy felt the flex of his own ribs kissing his heart. He looked up. At least 50 pairs of eyes stared back. No one said a word. Somewhere in the bowels of the treatment area, a phone was ringing. The sound echoed through the barred doors. The Grady's. Over a decade of civil rights hadn't done much. The waiting room was still divided, black on one side, white on the other. Like the pimps under the sign, they all stared at Jimmy at Don Wesley, at the river of blood flowing beneath them. Jimmy was still on top of Don. It was a lewd scene, one man on top of another, one cop on top of another. Still, Jimmy cradled his hand to Don's face, not the side that was blown open, the side that still looked like his partner. It's okay, Jimmy managed, though he knew it wasn't okay, it would never be okay. It's all right. Don coughed. Jimmy's gut twisted at the sound. He'd been sure the man was dead. Get help, he told the proud. But it was a whisper, a begging little girl's voice that came out of his own mouth. Somebody get help. Don groaned. He was trying to speak. The sight of his cheek was gone. Jimmy could see his tongue lolling between shattered bone and teeth. It's okay, Jimmy's voice was high as a whistle. He looked up again. No one would meet him. There were no nurses, no doctors. No one was going to help. No one was answering the damn telephone. Don groaned again. His tongue slacked outside of his jaw. It's okay, Jimmy repeated. Tears streamed down his face. He felt sick and dizzy. It's going to be okay. Don inhaled sharply like he was surprised. He held the air in his lungs for a few seconds before finally letting out a low, baleful moan. Jimmy felt the sound vibrating in his own chest. Don's breath was sour, the smell of a soul leaving the body. The cover of, color of his flesh didn't drain so much as feel like a pitcher of cold buttermilk. His lips turned an earthly funeral blue. The fluorescent lights cut white stripes into the flat green of his irises. Jimmy felt a darkness pass through him. It gripped his throat, then slowly reached its icy fingers into his chest. He opened his mouth for air, then forced it closed for fear that Don's ghost would flow into him. Somewhere the phone was still ringing. Shit, a raspy old woman grumbled. Doctor ain't never gonna get to me now. Oh, thank you. So much great energy. My pleasure. I think we're supposed to have some questions now. Oh, there are people there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, there. Hi, I'm Jean Ashton. I'm a, a novel writer, and I just finished a teaching stint down at Ferris and moved up to lovely Traverse City. And I had a question. Um, what, what point in your writing process for your book do your characters get up and start taking over the story? 
Um, I think always, um, because I, I'm, I'm, you know, all the characters are me. I'm aware of that, so maybe I'm not schizophrenic. There's your answer. <laughs> um, but I let the characters tell the story. You know, a lot of them have different opinions for me. They do things that I wouldn't necessarily do. Um, for instance, uh, run toward the danger as opposed to away from it. Um, and I just have to feel confident that I know this character well enough to let them do what they need to do. I mean, it goes back to the thing between Lena and Sarah in the hallway. I know these characters aren't going to have a happily ever after. Um, and so I have to get them to that point where they can have this sort of conflict and still be their own, their own person and, and still in many ways be a likable person. Um, because when people fight, usually someone picks a side. And I wanted to make sure that both sides could be seen. But as far as the characters just, excuse me, doing their own thing, I think that every page has that. I think that's kind of the fun of writing is being this different person. Um, one of the things I loved when I wrote my Grant County books was I would have one character. Um, I, I had a chief of police, and Lena was the detective who worked for him. And they would go to a crime scene, and then you would get his point of view. And then in the next chapter, you would get her point of view. And they were seeing the same thing, but they saw it completely different. And I love playing with that as a writer. Anyone else? Have, have you ever co-wrote a book with another author? Um, no, I haven't. I think I'm too arrogant. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked to uh, someone about doing it, and I think that we could have fun if we just left each other's sections alone. Um, but uh, maybe that's something for the future when I'm more relaxed about it. But how, you've I done mean, anthologies and so forth. Yeah, I've done. I love doing short stories, so I've had short stories within anthologies. Um, but you know, again, I've Not. just done my own thing. Uh, this woman here. This is quick. Is, uh, is Slaughter a pseudonym? No, it's my real name. Um, <laughs> I grew up with it. And, you know, I never even occurred, it never occurred to me that it worked out great for me um, <laughs> until people started asking. And it was like, it's, well, Smith, that's an interesting last name. And, you know, that's how it sounded to me because I just never, I got teased a little as a kid, mostly by my sisters. And I'm like, well, it's your name, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it worked out. It's a good thing I'm not writing romance. <laughs> Over. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, recent transplants from Atlanta, 30 years in Midtown. So I understand some of the things you're writing about there, and I'm definitely going to pick it up and uh, go for it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but my question isn't about that particular book, it's about your shoes. Yes? Are they comfortable? Who makes them and where can I get them? These are new balance and I'm one of those people, if I find a shirt or a shoe I like, I get three or four of them, which is why I have four Snoopy shirts. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I, they're very comfortable. They're the trail shoes. Perfect. <laughs> it's one over here. Are the bad kids up in the balcony, or? Yeah. I, I was a police officer during the 70s. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I was a police officer during the 70s and spent 25 years in the state police. And I found most of my career was loaded with humor. I mean, human beings are the, maybe in a tragic way, the funniest things on earth. And uh, <coughs> do you think you could ever write a novel that would encompass human tragedy in a humorous way? Well, I think I do have humor in my books. You know, some really outlandish things happen. And, and the cops, are, I'm sure you would get along great with them, because they did. They laughed all the time about the stupid things people did. Um, one of the stories I put in a book was a, about a, not this book, but another one, a bank robber who ran into the bank jumped on the counter, slipped and hit his head and passed out. Um, and that, that is not something that just happened once. That has happened all over the country. I'm sure you've probably heard, had similar cases. It, it is amazing the stupid things people do. Um, but nowhere is it stupider or more amazing than in Florida. 
Um, and I don't know if you had Carl Hyacin here, but no one realizes he's writing nonfiction. Uh, and, and there's, I have a friend who's in Florida, FDLE, and I can't use anything he tells me because no one would believe me. I mean, people are just crazy. Um, and hats off to you for your service. Any other questions? Right out there. Hi, I, I um, recall you saying that um, you were very appreciative of the fact that it's, um, it's a relief to be able to write a book knowing that it's going to be published. And therein sets the additional stress of doing it in a certain time frame. That wasn't the case when you first started writing. Can you tell us how long you were writing or how you made that first, um, or landed that first publishing situation? Well, I, um, I always wrote, except when I was in college, which if you want to hate writing, go to college, um, and reading, for that matter. Um, and so that really, fortunately, that wasn't for very long. Uh, it was three and a half years, and my dad is, as I said, very upset that I didn't finish the last two quarters. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, if I had known then what I know now, which is how incredibly rare it is just to get published, and I mean by a uh, publisher, not self-publishing, which is more ubiquitous now. Um, I probably wouldn't have done it, because the odds are just so against you. And, and then, I mean, if you think about the fact that there are 10 slots every week for the New York Times bestseller list, um, lots of people, hog, spaces on the list. Um, you know, there, there's 52 weeks in a year times 10. You know, so you've got to say, OK, well, 300 writers, maybe, are in the hardcover top 10 in the year. And just the major publishers publish a quarter of a million books a year. So statistically, I, I'm an English major, not a math major, but it has to be like 0.1% or somewhere around there, the possibility of being a New York Times bestseller. So just the, the fact that you want to get published is insane, because it's very unlikely to happen. So, um, but for me, I didn't listen to any of that. And, it, and even probably if someone had told me, I would have said, I'm going to be the one who gets it and actually makes it. Um, because I was that stupid. Uh, but I, I worked for 10 years working on different books, different styles of books, um, you know, writing um, sort of uh, revenge fantasies against uh, everyone I went to high school with, that sort of thing, you know. <laughs> those the, those self-indulgent first books that you have to get out and will never see the light of day if you're very lucky. That's why I'm worried about self-publishing, because I absolutely would have self-published. And then, you know, yeah. my god. You would have been ruined. How, I know, exactly. <laughs> How embarrassing that would have been. Um, because editorial is so important. And I, that's how you learn to be a writer and grow. And so I, you know, I didn't let anyone look at my work. I had one friend who looked at my work. And she was very honest um, about what she thought was working and what wasn't. And that was a very good thing for me to have. Um, and all the time I was trying to get an agent. And what I did that, that changed the course of my career is I got stationary printed. And this is when you actually had to have it printed. You couldn't do it on your computer. Um, and Because I, I thought, I need to present myself as a business person, because agents are business people. And you know if they, they want to sell your book, because that's how they make money. So I need to treat this like a business. And that was a big click for me. Um, and not to look at it when I got all these rejections as, oh, they hate me, it's horrible. I just thought, okay, well, this agent didn't think she could sell it. Maybe another agent will. Um, and so it was, it was 10 years of rejection and struggle and all that kind of stuff, and I finally got an agent. I found her in the writer's market, um, and you know they, they say what sort of books they're looking for and how to submit to them and that sort of thing. And this is back when we had... Um, mail through the U.S. Post Office still, and so every, every morning I'd go down to the post office and then I'd come back, you know, because mm -hmm. you know, I had gotten a rejection or I hadn't gotten anything, which is almost worse to have hope. <laughs> um, and so finally I got my agent, and then, um, as I said before, my Gone with the Wind book, nobody wanted it, um, and I wrote Blindsided, and I sent it to my agent, and it took a really long time to read it uh, because I was not earning any money for her at the time. And so while I was waiting for her to read it, I had an idea for another book uh, it, with the same characters. And so I started writing my second book, Kiss Cut. Um, and she, you know, I, I got to the end of Kiss Cut, and she still hadn't called me. 
Uh, and then finally she called me and she said, I think I could sell this. And I said, oh, well, good. Well, there's two of them, actually. <laughs> and she said, well, send me this, send me the other one. And so she didn't take as long to read it, but she took a while and she called me and she said, I think I can get you a two-book deal. And I said, well, I, th I really need a three-book deal because I'm working on the third one now. <laughs> and she said, stop writing. <laughs> but she got me the three-book deal. Um, and it seemed like a, you know, a 10-year overnight success. Uh, but really, it was the, the big difference was me looking at it as a business, because it is. I mean, people don't want to think that, but publishers aren't going to publish you because they like you. Um, they'll be very sad to let you go because they like you, but they won't keep publishing you. Um, and so I, have, I had to really um, take my business sense I had learned from running my sign company and, and look at it as, okay, well, I need to investigate the way I would a customer, you know, I was trying to sell a sign to to find out what kind of signs they would need. I need to investigate these agents and figure out what other books have they sold? What do they look for? You know, what reputation do they have? Who have they worked with in publishing? And at the time, there were 12 publishers. So, um, you know, so that, that's really how I got published. That's great advice for any writers, the professionalism. Absolutely. And just keep going and don't take it personally. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't take it personally. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? One of my favorite things about your books are the internal monologues that the characters have. It's often extremely funny. And it's not just the main characters, it's the, the secondary characters, even the very minor, minor characters. I mean, you did it with, the, with that prologue you just read with that character. I don't know if I'll ever see him again. I haven't read the book yet, but he mentioned his sister in the, in the pool. And, so you obviously know your characters very well. How do you get to know them? Do you do character sketches? Do you just think about them a lot? How do you get to that point where you know them well enough to write about? I, you know, I, it's, it's weird because it, I do think about them a lot, but I don't actively seek details about them. They just kind of bubble up. And I'm sure, you know, you know how when you meet somebody and you just make all these assumptions about them by the way they talk or if they're chewing gum or if they're short or too short or, you know, any, you know we all have this, this secondhand judgmental thing that we do when we see people. Um, and I think that happens when I'm thinking about the characters. And then when I'm actually putting them in bad situations in my head and seeing how they'll react and how they'll interact with other characters, that's the fun part. Um, but for me, you know, Every character has to have to be as fully fleshed out for me as the main character. Uh, especially, and, and that's not just because I'm writing crime thrillers and it's like in Star Trek, the Asian guy in the red shirt is going to get killed. Um, it's thinking that I owe it to those characters because if, if they merit just a couple of lines in a book, I need to say something about them that makes them memorable. Hi, Karen. Thank you again for being here. I was curious, earlier in the evening you talked about the fall being really busy for you. So does that mean you do most of your writing, say, from September to January and turn the book in? Or, in other words, how long does it take you to actually kind of finish a book in, in, in desk time? Well, um, as I said, when I'm working in a series book, I'll do the first chapter as soon as I finish the last book. Um, for Cop Town, I wrote part of it. It, it depends on my travel schedule also. Um, and th this year is very heavy with travel, so I've had to, you know, take a week here and there and work on things. And by the time I sit down, I'm really um, clear about what I want to do. It, to, to really date myself, Billy Wilder used to say, when I sit down on my typewriter, it's already written. And so when I sit down to write it, I've already worked out the framework for it. And so I can do, you know, I'll do 20 or 30 pages a day sometimes. Um, and, you know, it just, it all comes together that way. So, uh, for this book, I did a lot of writing in February and March, um, and then in the fall, I went back up to my cabin and I wrote the rest of it. Um, with the book I'm working on now, I think I'm mostly going to write it in the fall because I'm very clear about how it's going to go. And, um, I, um, have finally paid the price for my extremely poor posture. I've herniated a disc doing yoga, which... I, I knew that was a bad thing. Um, and so the this first part of the year when I normally write the book, I didn't have that luxury because I was in too much pain. And then um, there's part of your life that you never think of when you're an author, which is the international component. Um, so I've been to uh, London, Brussels, 
uh, the northern part of Belgium, Holland, um, and my U.S. tour so far. And then I've still got to go to Australia, New Zealand, and Germany. I'm going to start crying at the it, it, uh, it, it, before we get to the fall. So um, that's a lot of travel. So I, I, I have to be really stingy with my time about writing the books. But each book has its own kind of pattern. When I wrote Criminal, I had to do a lot of research for 1974 uh, because that's when the book was set. Um, when I wrote Cop Town, I had done a lot of research, so really it was less. Um, but each book has its different needs, and I just try to address them. We have time for one more question? Anybody? One more? No. Can I, can I ask a question? Please. <laughs> Do you guys support your local library? Sure do. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll let you have a book. <laughs> no more questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, what, just a wonderful. Thank you.